Thank you and welcome back. So I have some answers to some questions that I couldn't answer yesterday. And I just want to encourage you to keep interrupting me seriously. Just if you have any questions, stop me, yell at me. It will be better for all of us. I'm happy to get questions that I cannot answer and I look like an idiot here. That's great. Just go ahead and ask questions, whatever comes to your mind. So someone was asking me about, uh, yesterday it came up in the discussion about the phase convention independentness or dependentness of epsilon k. And, and, and of course what was said here is absolutely correct that the, any physical quantity is of course independent of phase conventions, but if you look at the standard expressions in the literature, so this is a review of uh, Buras and collaborators, then, then what you see can you hear me? Is this on? What, what, what you see is some expression that's obtained after using CKM unitarity. Um, and so epsilon k in the standard ex expressions is related to imaginary part of M12. I'll define what M12 is in a moment. And if you look at these expressions, it looks like that guy that I enlarged over there. And here one has used CKM unitarity partly because unitarity is also required to make the standard model result finite. And if you look at this result, then it's completely unclear how some rephasing of the CKM phase will drop out of the result. But, but, but it does. It's just, it's just highly non-apparent. There was another set of questions that we had a long discussion on about the renormalization of the CKM matrix. So actually, there are a bunch of papers on that in the literature. I just didn't remember the results. So this is one of them from 19. 98, and what these guys calculate is the running of the CKM element, so how Y up and Y down, the up and down Yukawa matrices run from the 100 GeV scale to the GUT scale, 10 to the 15 GeV, and what you see is, actually I should, ah, how is this? I lost the paper. Anyway, so it's mostly it turns out that, not surprisingly, it's mostly the elements which are in the third generation that, that, that run more than the others. And so, okay, so how MT runs, that's obvious. So, for example, if you take VCB, then at the, at, at the low energy scale, it has a value about 0.04, and we'll talk about it a little bit. And you see that if you run it up at the, to the gut scale, there are like 10% changes. And there are similar IGE effects for, for VUB, Etc. And, but these are, yeah, so, okay, that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. And, any questions? There was another paper that I lost. Wait. Well, it's, uh, ah, it's this guy. So, this is yet another set of authors from 2003. And there you can see explicitly that, uh, so there's a lot of discussion in the literature about some scheme independence of how you do the renormalization of the CKM matrix. So there are some subtleties that actually I didn't fully end up understanding last night. But you see that in a, in a, in a first approximation, you just do a universal rescaling of the VUB, VCB, and VTS, VTD entries. And this leaves the, the, the shape of the unitarity triangle uh, invariant. Uh, I think that we've said that the Yarskog invariant would not run, but it also runs. That also has a scale dependence. So if, 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 if any of us wants to read more on this, then there is a lot to learn for me as well as possibly for some of you. So any questions? So where we left it off and yesterday, after an hour and a bit, was sort of deriving uh, how the unitarization of the up and down Yukawa matrices leads you to the CKM matrix, and how the unitarity triangle is a useful way to look at many constraints on CKM elements and check whether they are or whether they are not consistent with one another. So I'll switch off the laptop for some time. And 
what I, okay, so, so, so we'll, we'll go through some of the constraints and I have cheated some expressions that will be relevant for, for this talk. I put up on the blackboard so that I don't need to waste time with it. And I just want to say a few more words about sort of uh, the, the conceptual foundations of uh, how I think about this, 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 this flavor physics program. So from a low energy effective field theory point of view, We saw that any flavor changing interaction is mediated in the standard model by, by the W boson. And so from the point of view of, of, of experiments at a few GeV scale at the B, at, 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 at MB or, or, or the D meson mass or whatever, where you can do some experiments from some hadronic decays, whether you look at something which is neutral meson mixing. So for example, this diagram mediates transitions between B0 and B0 bi. Or if you look at some penguin diagrams, which is another celebrated process, B2S gamma. Or you just look at ordinary semi-leptonic decays, like B2C electron neutrino. From the low energy point of view, each of these things are just some local operators which mediate some four fermion interaction. So if I'm at five GeV and I'm calculating some matrix element, I really cannot resolve that this is a top quark and this is a W boson. It's just some effective four fermion operator, which in the standard model happen to look like, oh sorry, so this is like B, if I do BB biomixing, so it's just this operator and it's coefficient I can calculate. In the case of B2S gamma, it's again some other local operator because all of this is like a point-like interaction when sort of the distance scales I can resolve is only one over MB. These things happen at a much higher energy and therefore a much shorter distance scale so I can represent it as a local operator. In the standard model, the operator that's generated is uh, sigma mu nu f mu nu, the dipole operator and because it flips chirality, it necessarily comes with, one over, with an MB factor, and it's suppressed by some scale because these are dimension six operators. And similarly, the semi-leptonic decays is just yet another operator that is a two quark, two lepton for a fermion operator, which in the standard model And of course, these scales in the standard model are the weak scale, some order one factor times MW. And when, so for, from this low energy point of view, this program is asking the questions, when you calculate, do the standard model calculations, can we see evidence for non-standard model contributions to these operators? Or can we see evidence for operators which are forbidden by some symmetry in the standard model? to be generated by new physics. So for example, in the standard model, this is, I mean, all of these, uh, so sort of this and that interaction is a left-handed current because the W only couples to left-handed left quarks and leptons. In the presence of new physics, you could get other operators which are exactly zero in the standard model and you can ask the question whether there is any experimental evidence for that. And, So again, when, when, when you interpret these measurements and you try to do the calculations, most of the time, the question is how well can we calculate the coefficients of these higher dimension operators and, and how well can we compare it with the data and figure out if there is some evidence for new physics or whether there isn't. And the reason that uh, in particular for understanding CP violation, that B meson decays offer a very rich playground is because, so we saw yesterday, or at least well, we didn't see it, but we talked about it, that if you think about that plot that I stupidly took off the screen, then epsilon K, CP violation in KK biomixing, that's an important and strong constraint on the CKM parameters, but we tangentially talked about it, that the other CP violating quantity in the k on sector, which is called epsilon prime, and it's related to direct CP violation, that has so large hadronic un uncertainties from QCD that we 
at the moment don't know how to understand quantitatively, that we don't know how to plot that on that plane, other than to say that it's order of magnitude is where you would expect it to be. So, any, any questions? So, so what's special about B physics? And there are some, both on the theoretical side and on the experimental side, it has sort of, it's a lucky coincidence of, of, of several nice features. So on the theory side, we said, we talked yesterday about, uh, so, so in, the, in the K-on system, all of these CP violating quantities that, that were, so epsilon and epsilon prime, they are very small. In, in the B system, you can have large CP violation, and we'll see examples. If you look at flavor changing neutral currents in general, and BV by mixing, so flavor changing neutral currents that I will have abbreviate as FCNCs, they do not have suppression due to small Yukawa coupling, so there is no gym suppression. And there is also no suppression by small CKM elements because, uh, because of this approximate diagonal structure of the, of the CKM matrix. VTB is, 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 is extremely close to unity. So, so many of the suppressions that apply for a K on CP violation don't occur for a B CP violation. And, 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 and we'll get to it tomorrow that some of the hadronic physics some of the QCD physics is tractable. Namely, one can do many first principles calculations for hadronic physics in B decays, essentially as a consequence of the B quark mass being an order of magnitude larger than this typical scale of hadronic interactions, about 500 MeV or so. And at the same time, there are and as I said, it's a kind of a lucky coincidence that experimentally there is, it's a fortunate coincidence that uh, VCB is small and therefore the B lifetime is, is, is fairly large. It's something like 1.5 picosecond. So just to indicate this, so VCB in magnitude is about 0.04 uh, you know that uh, if you look at the lifetime of a B meson or a D meson, it should, the total decay bits goes like the fifth power of the mass of the particle. So a B meson, which is three times as heavy as a D meson, should be much shorter lived. And that's not the case because VCB turned out to be substantially smaller than, for example, so VCB is substantially smaller than VCS, sorry, VCD, that is, the Kabibo angle. And, and why that's important is uh, because the long beam as on lifetime allows you to study these processes experimentally. So this is a plot from 25 years ago from the Aleph experiment at lab. And I just like to show it in, 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 in talks because it's just such a beautiful example that you know, you have a 10 meter big detector, and already in the early 90s or late 80s, there was a technology to resolve this B meson traveling a few millimeters in this 10 meter detector before it decays to some particle. And, you know, you have, you have something very quantum mechanical happening, and you can draw this classical picture because of the long lifetimes. You can reconstruct the B decay and then the subsequent D decay, so with all these tracks coming from displaced vertices. And that's because, and that essentially boils down to this fact that VCB is as small as it is. Another experimentally uh, useful or critical element of, of, of was that there is this upsilon resonance, so this is a BB bar resonance at like 10 point some GeV, which is barely above the mass threshold of decaying into a B0, B0 by a pair. So we'll see that by doing E plus E minus collisions at a particular center of mass energy, you can produce essentially B mesons in a very well controlled environment and study their decays in a way that is impossible 
for K mesons and D mesons, which you always produce uh, together with other type of hadrons. And the third thing, which was kind of important uh, for this program, at least in E plus C minus colliders, it's less so for the LHC, that in the B sub D sector, so not for B sub S, but B by D mesons, the mass difference happens to be comparable to the total lifetime. So the delta M over gamma is some number of order one. I don't remember if it's 0.7 or whatever it is, but what, and what this tells you is that, so we'll, we'll, we'll come in a moment to BV by oscillation, so if you produce an initial B meson, then the two mass eigenstates have a very small mass splitting and you have oscillations between these two states and the characteristic time scale of the oscillation is comparable to the lifetime. So that allows you to study it experimentally uh, quite nicely. Any questions? Um, so, unfortunately, I have to tell you a little bit about the formalism how of, of, of neutral meson mixing in general. So I'll use the B mesons as an example. So uh, probably you will know because otherwise you should have asked me, a B0 meson is defined to be a state which is, don't ask me why, it's a B by D, whereas the B by zero is the state which is composed of a B and a D by. There are some historical reasons for that. It's maximally confusing. And so these two states, the, 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 these box diagrams we talked about yesterday for KK by mixing. So there are analogous diagrams in the B case. So B can emit a W and turn into an up chime or a top quark and become an S eventually. And Sorry, let's do that. So these are Ws. So there are these, con there, there are these uh, second order, whatever, there are these second order electroweak processes which give you non-zero transitions from an initial B0 to a B0 by or vice versa. And therefore, you end up with, so, the, the, so these are the flavor eigenstates, which have well-defined flavor properties. And, and, and as we'll see, for how the particles decay in weak interactions, these are the convenient states to describe what happens. However, the propagating degrees of freedom, sort of the, the, the eigenvalues, the eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian, are not these states, by, but states which are usually labeled as B-heavy and B-light for just the heavier and the lighter mass eigenstates because you have to call them something. And these are usually defined by some linear combination of uh, B0 and B0 by with some coefficients which are usually called P and Q. This is just notation. So these are the mass eigenstates. And these are the guys which, uh, if you look at their time evolution, they have trivial time evolution in the sense that uh, it just looks like whatever, e to the minus i m, either heavy or light. So they, there are the two mass eigenvalues and the two different lifetimes. So there's, so there's a phase factor that you pick up in the time evolution, which depends on the mass, and there is a lifetime which tells you how quickly these states decay times whatever the states at time zero. And, and if you want to understand this time, whatever, what, what, how you get the eigenvalues of the, how, how you get the mass eigenvalues and the lifetime eigenvalues, you have to solve a Schrodinger equation, which describes the time evolution of these states, so I D D T. So there's this two component state, which is B zero and B by zero.
And sort of the complication is that it's not the Hermitian operator which describes the time evolution, because there is a piece which just describes the mixing, and so M is a Hermitian matrix. But it also decays, so there is another Hermitian matrix, gamma, which comes with a factor i, and that's what describes the, the decay of these states. So both of these are, these are two by two Hermitian matrices. And, 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 and that's it, so if you, if I, so if I can calculate the entries of this matrix M and gamma, then I can diagonalize this matrix, and that will tell me what are P and Q that defines the linear combinations that gives you the mass eigenstates of this, of this, of this B0, B0 by a system that oscillates and decays, and, 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 and that's the uh, system that we want to study. So an important point is that the CPT theorem tells you that the diagonal entries of these matrices, M11, so M11 has to be the same as M22, because in the absence of mixing, this would be just the masses of B0 and B0 bar, and, and in the absence of mixing, obviously this would be the correct uh, mass eigenstates, and then because of CPT theorem, they would have to have the same mass. And similarly, gamma 1, 1 has to be the same as gamma 2, 2. And the point is that, yes? I can't hear you. Sorry, let me come closer. Okay. The CBT uh, theorem tells M11 equal M22 and the gamma is the same. It's not specific for the B meson. It is for any neutral uh, It's transition. true for any neutral meson. So the, I'm, I'm using B as a label. The same formalism can be used for D mesons, for B sub S mesons, for KK by mixing. Yeah. It's just that the parameters would have different values in these different systems. But the fact that uh, the fact that the two diagonal entries in the mass matrix and the decay with matrix are the same, that's true for all of them. Just their numerical values are different in, 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 in the four different neutral meson systems. So, 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 so the, the key question is what are these off-diagonal entries of, uh, in M12 and gamma12 that will come into uh, describing the physics of, this, of these things. And, and so gamma12 comes from real intermediate states, so, so things where, which are common final decay products of B0 and B0 by. So in the case of the B system, you draw the same kind of uh, box diagrams, but now you can only have the up and the chime quark in the intermediate state. And certainly, the up and chime can be on shell in the decay of a B meson. Whereas, whereas M12, the, the leading contribution to the BB by transition will come from the top quark because the top quark will have the least amount of suppression by CKM elements and also because the top quark will, have the, will not have this gym suppression. So as we said yesterday for the K-on case, when, when, I, when I mean the top quark contribution, that's really some contribution which comes like, which enters as m top square minus m chime square or m up square over m w square. But this is not a suppression for the top contribution. So, so it turns out that the top completely dominates m12. And because now this box diagram is, is, has two w's and two top quarks, each of which is much heavier than the external 5 GeV energy scale that I have as maximal momentum entering uh, 
uh, these uh, quark lines, this has to be, it has to be an extremely good approximation that this can be represented by a local operator, and this can be calculated to higher, uh, to either adjust this order or including uh, higher order QCD corrections using perturbative QCD because these loop momenta are of order 100 GeV that is relevant for this problem and not, so the GeV scale does not matter for, for what goes on in this loop. It only matters at the end of the day for evaluating the matrix element of this and we'll get to that in, in, in a few minutes. So, so because, so the point is that gamma one two comes from these box diagrams with up and chime quarks, whereas M one two is, comes from the box diagrams with the top quark. Because of the gym mechanism, M one two over gamma one two. I should have written it the other way around. Gamma one two over M one two absolute value has to be of order some scale of order mb square over mw square. Just from the fact that gamma 1, 2 does not have the top contribution here. So in general, diagonalizing these matrices gives you some fairly complicated solutions. But if I can use the approximation that gamma 1, 2 is much less than m 1, 2, then one can actually write down the solution of uh, this eigenvalue equation in a fairly simple way. So what one finds is that delta m, which is defined to be the heavy state minus the light state, so this is by definition positive, is given by twice the absolute value of m 1, 2. So basically, you calculate this box diagram and its matrix element between B and B by B zero and B zero by states, and you take that's a complex number in general, and you take uh, the absolute value multiplied by two, and that's the mass difference. And delta gamma is Is, the, is minus two times real, value, real part of M12, gamma12 star divided by M12. I can never remember any of this. And that's also the same as twice gamma12 times the phase of uh, gamma12 over M12. And why, I'm right, why I write down all of this will become clear uh, soon enough. So, and you can write down that what is Q and P, and that's also going to play an important role. So Q over P is given by minus M12 star over M12 times one minus a half imaginary part of gamma 1, 2 over M12. And someone should have yelled at me that I didn't define what delta gamma was. And uh, for unfortunate reasons, whereas delta m is defined as m heavy minus m light, the logical definition would be to define delta gamma as gamma heavy minus gamma light. But it is usually defined as gamma light minus gamma heavy, just to make things confusing. And the, the, so the reason for this is because it's with this definition, the delta, so in the, in the B sub D system, delta gamma is actually a tiny quantity and it's not yet measured experimentally. In the B sub S system, delta gamma is much bigger than in the B sub D system. And this definition is chosen such that in the standard model, you expect delta gamma to be positive in the B sub S system. And that's now confirmed by LHCB measurements. In any case, the, any of these signs by themselves are entirely convention dependent but the relative signs between delta M and delta gamma are physical, and that can be used to test our understanding of the short distance physics. So one immediate consequence of, 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 being, of, of M12 being much bigger than gamma12 in the standard model, model in both the B sub D and B sub S systems, 
that you see that in general, I have to calculate this box diagram and evaluate its matrix element between B0 and B0 by states. There will be some associated hadronic uncertainties in, that, in the calculation of that matrix element, which is done either using, historically it was done using various models, and for the last five, 10 years, it's essentially there is no competition to doing it using lattice QCD methods, and actually that's a very well understood lattice QCD calculation, how to calculate the matrix elements of these four fermion operators between B0 and B0 by states, there are still some hadronic uncertainties in calculating delta M in the standard model of order of something like 20, 25 percent. For the calculation of delta gamma, because it relates to physical intermediate states, it's much more susceptible to long distance uh, hadronic physics. And the calculations of delta gamma, even though there is a formalism to calculate it uh, in a from first principles QCD, the calculation of delta gamma has larger uncertainties than delta M. But you see from this expression right away that if M12 is short distance dominated, then Q over P in magnet, and, and gamma12 we said is much smaller than M12, so the, the second term is tiny, then Q over P is going to be a complex number whose magnitude is unity, because it's just M12 star over M12. And its phase is going to be determined entirely by short distance physics. So that's going to be extremely important for, 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 for understanding CP violation in the B system, that even though delta M and delta gamma has substantial uncertainties, we can understand the phase associated with BB biomixing from short distance physics without knowing essentially anything about non-perturbative QCD interactions to a better than a percent level. And any questions? So that was a plot of just looking at uh, time depend. So, okay, so this is a beautiful measurement by LHCB. So I, sa I said that in the B sub D system, the characteristic time scale of oscillations and decay is comparable. That's very different in the B sub S system, where oscillations happen much, much more rapidly than the decay itself. And what's on this plot is the LHCB measurement of. Uh, of essentially this oscillation. So they can identify an initial B0, where B0 bar, sorry, this is B sub S, so a B sub S bar meson at the production, and I will show you how that's done, at least qualitatively. And, what, and, and you can study as a function of uh, the elapsed time from the, from, 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 from the production of this B sub S or B sub S biomason, whether at the time of the decay, it decays as the particle that was produced or whether it decays as, 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 the, as the anti-particle, as, uh, whether an initial B0 decays as B0, B sub S0 or B sub S0 bi. And you see that the challenge in the case of B sub S was that this oscillation happens so frequently compared to the lifetime, that essentially, at the time of the decay, it's a random chance whether an initial B sub S meson decays as if it was still B sub S, or whether it decays as B sub S bi. So there is almost perfect mixing, and because of these very rapid oscillations, it, it, we knew for a long time that B sub S oscillated, but the problem in the B sub S case was to resolve these oscillations by having very, very fine time resolution to be able to, to get to this measurement that was first done at, at, at CDF, at the Tevatron, and then now much more precisely at LHCB.
So, so once you know how to calculate delta m and delta gamma, I, so, so we said before that if you were interested in the decay and the production of, uh, of a B meson from weak interactions, then it's the flavor eigenstates, which are the natural uh, states to describe production and decay. However, the time evolution is simplest in terms of the mass eigenstates. And you can just work it out that if you produce an initial B0, a B0 bar, you decompose it as B heavy and B light. You time evolve it with this pure exponential form of, until time t. And then you project it back onto the flavor eigenstates. And so I wrote down the equations that govern this time dependence. So an initial B0 after some time t has some probability to still be a B0 or become a B0 bar. And vice versa, an initial B0 bar after time t can either still look like a B0 bar or it may have oscillated into a B0. And these functions, so all of what I wrote down is valid in the limit where, where the lifetime difference is actually set to zero. Otherwise, these expressions are more complicated. And so these functions g plus and g minus have an, sort of they pick up a phase over time. And of course, there is a term describing the decay. And they look like cosine or a, I times sine delta m t over 2. And why I bothered writing, putting it on the table will become clear in a moment. So how can you study CP violation? In some sense, the simplest form of CP violation is CP violation in the decay of some particle. And so let's just take an example. If you look at some process like B goes to K pi, which at the quark level comes from B goes to U, U by S. There are several contributions in general to some B decay. So in this case, you can, there's a, there's a contribution which just comes from an ordinary four Fermi interaction, well, B goes to a U, U bar S. But you also have these so-called penguin diagrams. Well, this is sort of schematic drawing because I should really talk about some effective operators, but never mind. Uh, what's relevant uh, is, is just that there are several contributions. So if I want to write down what is the amplitude, for say in this case, B goes to some final state F, let, let that be K pi. Then, in general, there are several contributions to this decay amplitude. So there is some sum, sorry. There are, so there are some sub-amplitudes, the matrix elements of each of these contributions. And let me use a different index than I. So there are two different kind of phases that can occur in these hadronic matrix elements. Some of them, which are called strong phases, relate to some hadronic rescattering effects. And some other phases, which are called weak phases, that come from the Lagrangian. So in the standard model, it comes from the complex phase in the CKM matrix. In the presence of new physics, there could be new sources of, of these weak phases. And the point is that their distinguishing property is that one of them, so the strong phases, which come from QCD rescattering effects, are CP even, because strong interaction is symmetric under CP. Once we have neglected theta QCD, which we know that is negligible for all of flavor physics. And these other type of phases, which come from complex parameters in the Lagrangian, are CP odd. So what this means is that if I write down the Opposite, so whatever the CP conjugate process, which is B by 
goes to f bar, then there will be the same type of contributions. But some of these, so, and some of these phases will be the same that come from QCD rescattering effects, and some of these phases will change sign. And once you have more than one contribution to a decay, then you can have situations that these strong phases and these weak phases are non-trivial rel relative in the, in the two contributions. And you can end up in a situation that if you just take the, the decay rate, which is the, whatever, the absolute value square of these amplitudes, then, so if the decay rate for a B to decay to some final state is not equal to the decay rate for the CP conjugate process, then obviously that's a manifestation of CP violation. And and so this type of CP violation always comes from interference between different contributions to a decay. And their characteristic property is that in no cases that I know of can we compute well enough the hadronic matrix elements that we can understand these kind of phenomena at a precision level from first principles. So this is the type of CP violation that is epsilon prime in the K-on sector. And also in the B system, in particular in this B to K pi type decays, it was discovered by Bobois and Bell that whereas this type of CP violation in the K-on sector is at the 10 to the minus five level, in the B system it's really an order of one effect. So so, so, for example, in, in this B2K pi type decays, there is something like a 10% direct CP violation of this type, which is experimentally observed. And on the one hand, that by itself is, is, is quite exciting because it tells you that in the standard model, in the quark sector, CP violation in some sense is not a small effect. It's really an order of one effect, which was, however, for decades, it looked like a small effect in the k -on sector because in the k -on sector, it is sort of masked by the gym suppression and the small CKM effect. So there's some particular suppression factors in the k -on system which make CP violation tiny in the K sector, but in the B sector in general, it's, it's a large effect. And, and sort of the exceptions is where it's small and not when it's large. Yes? Yes, so in the standard model, this phase is always related to the CKM phase. And in the presence of new physics, there could be other phases which are unremovable complex parameters in the Lagrangian that would change sign for a process and its CP conjugate. But in the standard model, phi is always related to the one phase in the CKM matrix. So all, all of these so all of the direct CP violation phenomena, and there are like, I, I don't even know how many of these have been observed with the more than five sigma significance. All of them somehow connects in the standard model to the CKM phase. The only problem is that we can't calculate the hadronic phases, the, the CP even phases, and the magnitudes of the hadronic amplitudes well enough to make very precise tests of the standard model by doing these type of measurements. There is one particularly interesting case that sometimes, some of you may have heard about, which is sometimes called the K-pi puzzle, which actually relates to the difference between two of these uh, CP violation measurements in different B to K-pi final states, so between, I think, K plus, uh, pi zero and k plus pi minus, and if any of you know about it and want to ask me about it, then we should talk afterwards. Because, so th that's an interesting case where by taking the difference of two channels, one would hope that some of these hadronic physics can be understood better because you are only interested in understanding the difference of two things. And, and I just want to say that, that it is possible for many of these 
effects that you know, there are like hundreds of papers written in the literature discussing whether there could be some new physics hidden in these measurements. And from my point of view, all of that is inconclusive at the moment, but there is certainly a possibility in the next 10 years to understand this better theoretically and, 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 and thereby, obviously, the sensitivity to possible new physics contributions would increase. Any questions? So to, to go towards uh, more understandable things, yes, please. Sir, but um, when you were um, comparing the magnitude for gamma 1, 2 and m 1, 2 for B systems, so uh, I didn't quite understand how you concluded that gamma 1, 2 will be much less than m 1, 2 there. So if you can explain. I understand that if you can calculate the box diagram, you just uh, extract out the imaginary part and mm, call it gamma 1, 2. So why that part is small? I mean, what is the difference uh, between K system and B system? Uh, the magnitude, relative magnitude of gamma 1, 2 and M 1, 2. So I should say it differently. I think if, if, if you want me to make a, a strictly correct statement, that what I should say is that I'm calculating all contributions that contribute to the matrix element of the full weak Hamiltonian to any power between B0 and B0 bar. And I just decompose it as the Hermitian and the anti-Hermitian part. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But you have now the M12. So, so loosely speaking, each of these intermediate quark contributions is proportional to the quark mass square over MW square. Right. So M12 is dominate. So therefore, M12 will be dominated by the top quark contribution, but the top quark cannot contribute to an on-shell intermediate state, right. and therefore gamma 1, 2 only receives contributions from up and chime in these box diagrams. That's fine, but uh, in, when there is a top quark, there is a complex quantities in VTB and VTD. So what about them? They, they will contribute to the imaginary part of the amplitude? No, 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 but, but they will, so, so M1, 2 and, uh, and M21 are the complex conjugates of each other, right? So if I, if I, if I now interchange and I look at the, so this is B0 by to B0, the other one is B0 to B0 by, and you expect to have a complex conjugate. So M12 is not a real number. M12 is still complex. So there's nothing wrong with M12 having the complex VTD and VTB CKM elements in it. The important thing is that uh, that M12 is M21's complex conjugate, right, or something like that. Okay. Okay. But but M12 by itself is not a real number; it's a complex number. Does that? Uh, okay. Let me ask you later. We can talk about it later. Where? So. So CP violation in mixing, and we are getting towards more interesting topics. So, so if CP was a conserved, if, if CP was conserved by the weak interactions, then the CP eigenstates and the mass eigenstates would be the same, and since this guy is the, com is the CP conjugate of one another up to a possible convention-dependent phase, you would expect that the CP eigenstates should be, again, up to just some trivial phase, just the whatever, B0 plus minus B0 bar,
And you would expect if the CP eigenstates were the same as the mass eigenstates, that the absolute value of P and Q would have to be the same. So this is what I meant before, that there could be some phase factor, which is entirely a convention-dependent thing, right? For any external particle, I can define a phase that, uh, that, that, that is an arbitrary convention. So I, by defining the phase of B0 to be whatever I want it to be, I could change the phase of P and I could change the phase of Q. But if the CP eigenstates, so if, if the CP eigenstates equal to the mass eigenstates, then you would have Q absolute value equal to P absolute value and And that's it. And both in the, so, so, so in the, but, but, the, but it is possible that this is not the case. If, 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 so if you, if you have a situation that Q over P absolute value is not equal to one, then that would tell you, for example, that the, that the B heavy and the B light states, the two physical states, so you can just look at P, B zero, uh, plus minus Q B zero bar. So if I take the scalar product of these states, that's just P square minus Q square, right? And so if there is CP violation in mixing, that is P over Q not equal to one in absolute value, then it's a funny situation that the physical states are no longer orthogonal to one another and again, this is sort of another way to see that CP violation is, is really intrinsically a quantum mechanical phenomenon, that there's really no classical analog that you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, you find what the mass eigenstates are, and in the presence of CP violation, it could happen that the mass eigenstates are not orthogonal to one another. And this is actually something that's experimentally observed to happen in the K system. This is related to the real part of epsilon K. And the experimental searches for this effect in the B and B sub S systems. So you may have heard that a few years ago there was an anomaly from the D0 experiment. So what is plotted up there is sort of this CP violation in B, B biomixing on the horizontal axis and CP violation in B sub S, B sub S biomixing on the vertical axis. The standard model is that red dot with extremely small uncertainties, and I will define for you in a moment what this quantity ASL is. And the D0 experiment at, at, at the Tevatron measured the particular linear combination of these two quantities and found what is quoted as about a three point some sigma discrepancy from the standard model expectation. The E plus E minus uh, B factories, Baboy and Bell, have measured this band. They only produce B sub D mesons. And LHCB and uh, I think D0 as well, they measured just this uh, directly, just the CP violation in the B sub S case. You see that this type of CP violation, except for this anomaly, whatever, this uh, intriguing measurement by D0, it has not been observed. So this type of CP violation has only been seen in the, in, in, in the K-ON system. But I will explain in a moment that the standard model prediction in this case is extremely precise. And you see that at least from one experiment, there is sort of a three sigma tension with the expectations. So what is this quantity A sub SL? It is called A sub SL because uh, historically, People looked at it as uh, measuring the CP asymmetry in some electronic decays. So the definition of ASLT for an E plus C minus B factory, like what Babar and Bell was, was defined to be the time dependent rate of an initial B0 after time T to decay to a positive lepton and anything else minus 
the time-dependent rate for an initial B0 bar after time t to decay into L minus x divided by the sum of these two things. And you might ask what the hell I'm talking about. So let's think of for a moment what is, okay, let, let's do this. So what is, how can a B, so a, a B by zero contains a B quark, and normally its dominant decay, once it decays semi-leptonically, would be with a virtual W. So it would decay to a charm quark, and a positive charged lepton, and a neutrino, right? No, I'm wrong. What, what am I, sorry. What? Did I totally screw up my notes? Well, a B quark, if it decays to a chime, it's certainly an L minus. So, Correct me if I'm saying nonsense. I think my notes must be wrong. So the dominant decay of a B has to be this guy, right? So it's B to C, L minus, an anti-neutrino. So what we are interested here is exactly the opposite. We want to have some asymmetry, which is the measure of, okay, so there's the spectator quark of the B sort of the, of, of an in, so this is a B biomason. So we want to see what is the probability of a B biomason oscillating into a B0 before it decays. So a B0 contains a B quark. No, sorry, a B0 contains a B bi quark. Ah, okay. this is so easy. Okay, I'm always confusing myself. <laughs> so a B0 bi goes to an L minus dominantly. So I'm asking what is the probability that the B0 bi, when it decays, it decays in the oscillated state, so as a B0, and then it would produce an L plus, right? So therefore, I'm conjecturing that my signs are totally wrong. So what I'm asking is, what is the probability that I made the B0 at time zero, and after time t, it decays after having oscillated? Where what is the probability that a B0 bar decays after a time t from this oscillated part of its wave function, so that I am measuring the piece, which is not the same flavor as the as the time of production, but the opposite flavor. So you see that the difference between, so that asymmetry that I wrote down there will just get contributions from this piece and that piece. And so all the exponential time dependence will drop out when I take the absolute value squares. And what this will give me, so that's too far away. So B0, what do I want? I want, so it's going to be Q over P squared for the absolute value square of this. This other piece will be P over Q squared. And there will be some universal exponential dependence which drops out from the ratio. So this is just going to be Q over P squared plus P over Q squared. And since empirically, we know that you, you see that this ASL quantity deviates from the standard model at more, oh, sorry, it's, it's, its magnitude is less than a percent. So P over Q is to a very good approximation equal to one, and therefore the denominator to a very good approximation is two. And so I can write this as Q over P to the four minus one. So 
happens is q over p. So this is going to be the same as q over p minus 1, right? Plus higher order terms, which are extremely small. And so, so the reason that these are interesting measurements is because we said that in the standard model, q over p minus 1 comes from the imaginary part of gamma 1, 2 over m 1, 2. We said that gamma 1, 2 over m 1, 2 is suppressed as mb square over mw square. So that's why we expect it to be tiny. In the standard model, there is another effect that if the up and the chime quark were degenerate in mass, then you would expect to be an additional suppression by m chime square minus m up square over m b square. So this quantity in the standard model is really extremely tiny, which is why the standard model prediction is just a dot on that plot with extremely small. It's not that the uncertainties are tiny as a fractional uncertainty, but the whole effect is so small that that's why it looks like a super precise prediction, which on this scale it is. But the point is that if there were new physics contributions to BBY mixing, then this suppression factor could easily be eliminated by having a new physics contribution to BB biomixing, and that's how you could get a large effect due to new physics in these kind of measurements. So as you see from that plot, this story right now is inconclusive. We don't know whether there is or whether there isn't a hint from that green ellipse that, that does not agree with the standard model point. And it's just something that's going to be interesting to, to see how things develop with more precise measurements with LHCB and, and, and the future upgrade of the Bell experiment. Any questions? So the case where one can really get uh, precise information about, uh, about the standard model or new physics is actually the third type of CP violation, which is CP violation in the interference in some decay with and without mixing. And I'll explain in a moment what I mean. So the picture one usually draws is that if you have some final state f and we'll use a particular state, j psi k short, as an example, because it's a, it's, it, it was a particularly important process for, for the B factories and because it's also one of the cleanest example of this type of CP violation that is tractable without much hadronic uncertainty. So, so in particular, if F, let's just take it for simplicity to be a CP eigenstate final state, which this guy is. So, this, so J psi is a CC bar meson, is the light, uh, is, 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 is the, yeah, it's a CC bar meson and K short is a, as is the linear combination of S by D and D by S, which is approximately CP even. So, so when we look at such a process, then the, in general, there are two different decay paths. B0 can decay directly into this final state, or B and B by can mix with each other, and then you can have this decay. And the asymmetry that one measures experimentally is again similar to, to this that you are looking at producing a B0 meson at time zero and after time t you look at its decay rate to a particular final state. So in this case,
you look at a similar rate difference, just not for, for a semi-leptonic final state, but a CP eigenstate final state divided by the same things, by the sum of the same. So the difference divided by the sum. And it would probably take me more time than I have to work out, so, so you can work that rate out So let me just make some notations. So A, I'm going to call the AF to be so A and A bar are the, are the amplitudes for B0 and B0 bar to decay to this final state. And using the formulae, which are at the opposite end of the, t on the black of, of the blackboard, you can easily work out that if you produce initially a B0, after a time t, it will, its decay to that final state will have a term that comes with G plus of t times A, because it's B0 decaying into the final state. And there will be another term, which is this other function of time, times A bar. And likewise, for a B0 bar, after a time t, there will be a term which is some function of the elapsed time times the amplitude a that I defined there, and, and another term times a bar, and you take the absolute value square, and that will give you an expression for this uh, uh, decay rate difference. And the final expression is going to be is going to have a particularly simple, well, it's not that simple. I'll, so there's, there's a quantity lambda that one always defines for this decay. So lambda is defined as Q over P times this A by over A. And it's convenient because one can write this, this time-dependent CPA symmetry in a very simple form in terms of uh, lambda. And it really takes 10 minutes, to, what, five, 10, it's, a, it's, a, it's like four or five lines to work out, take the absolute value squares and work out this difference. So there will be a term which goes like sine delta mt, and there will be a term that goes like cosine delta mt, and that's because whatever g plus and g minus absolute value square has this one plus or minus cosine delta mt, the cross term g plus conjugate times g minus will have a sine delta mt dependence, and when you work through it, you get an expression like this, and and the reason this is interesting is because we saw on the previous plot that what's happening here that empirically we know that q over p absolute value minus 1 is less than something like 0 0.01 and so if we find some final state f that a by over a, so if there is no direct CP violation, if also a by over a absolute value is approximately equal to one, then you see that that will imply that lambda absolute value is going to be one, so the second term is going to vanish. And the first term, so once lambda absolute value is one, is just going to be imaginary part of lambda times sine delta mt, and the imaginary part of lambda, if lambda absolute value is 1, is just going to be a phase. And that's going to be the phase difference between, so there's the direct decay, which is described by the amplitude A. There is the B0 bar with the A bar. So this measurement in particular final states where A bar over A is close to 1 is just measuring a phase difference between these two different decay paths from a B0 to F, and B0 oscillating to B0 bar goes to F. And everything about the hadronic physics, how B mesons mix, how these decays happen, 
is going to drop out from this time-dependent CP asymmetries. And you essentially measuring some parameter in the Lagrangian, some weak phase, without having to know anything about hadronic physics. So actually, how you do these, exper uh, these, these measurements experimentally, that's an interesting thing. And this was highly non-trivial. This is why these dedicated machines, the E plus E minus B factories, were built. So what happens experimentally is we said at the beginning that in E plus E minus collision, there is a particular energy, the mass of the, this 4S resonance, that if you tune the beam energies to that mass, then you are producing B0 and B0 bar. And There is another complication that in order to have a long enough decay time for the B0 and the B0 bar, you had to build these asymmetric E plus E minus B factories so that both the B and the B bar are boosted in the same direction. So what one measures experimentally is that, so you are producing a B0 and B0 bar. This measurement relies crucially on the fact that this is a quantum correlated state. So if at a time t, one of the, so B0 and B0 by oscillate, as you could see over there, as we talked about it. And as long as both, neither, as long as neither of the two mesons have decayed, if at a given time, one of them is B0, the other one has to be B0 by and vice versa. So the way these experiments were done is that you reconstruct both of the B decays. In one case, you look at some decay which tells you, for example, by looking at an energetic lepton, that which so in, you look at one decay which identifies the flavor of one of the Bs, and then you look at the other B decay into your favorite CP eigenstate final state, like J psi k short. And, but, and, and, and basically, you can directly measure experimentally this time difference between these two decays. And that's the time that occurs here. Because when you flavor tag one of the Bs, that's where the clock starts for the, for the other one. Because if you know that at the time t, one of them was a B0, then at the same time, the other one was a B0 bar and vice versa. And that's how you have access to these decay rates as a function of the proper time of these particles. The situation, in some sense, is simpler at LHCb. So when you do the same kind of measurement at hadron colliders, there are some other serious complications. But, but, but just this, so people call this flavor tagging, because you need to tag the flavor to tell you what is the initial state at time zero. In, at, the, at LHCb, in some sense, the situation is simpler because you are producing BB bar. And the hadronization of the two B hadrons is independent from one another. So the time, so, 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 so the, the two B, so, the, so, so one of the Bs can, for example, hadronize into a B sub D or a B sub S meson, and then it oscillates with its given time dependence. But the other B can go into any form of B hadron. It can be a charged B meson and not a neutral B meson. It can go, it can become a B baryon. And so, so this is not a quantum correlated state, and therefore this time dependence in some sense is simpler. You, so you have different experimental techniques to study the same type of observables. And so just to give you an example, so in the case of J psi k short, which is a particularly clean example of this, so that's a plot from a Bobar paper. So what you see, so in this case, the second term is to a very good approximation not present. So the red and the blue curves are telling you that just the decay rates of an initial B0 and an initial B0 by tag as a function of proper time on the horizontal axis to decaying into J psi k short. And the lower part of the plot shows this asymmetry where the oscillation period is given by the mass difference and sort of the magnitude, 
how big these oscillations are is so imaginary part of lambda in this case is uh, whatever, it's just the sign of the argument of lambda, right? I'm saying something totally trivial. So, so, that, so that's what the measurements do. And so what, so let me take five more minutes just to explain what this really measures in terms of uh, CKM parameters, and then I will So I should have said here there before that Q, okay, so, so what is lambda for a B to J psi K short? What, are, what, what, what is being measured here? Um, let me erase this. So if you look at how this decay can happen, then there are again so-called tree and penguin diagrams. So you can have a B goes to C, C bar S. This is a D bar. So people usually write this amplitude as VCB, VC S star. And I'm just going to call it symbolically a T, which is some complex number. And there are also so-called penguin contributions, which is, so this is B to S with a W, and this is CC by. And again, here you have up chime and top in this, in, 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 in the, in, in these loop diagrams. And so there will be a piece which is uh, VUB, VUS star times, so I'm, I'm calling this as P sub U for up penguin. And there is a VCB, VCS star times PC plus VU, uh, VTB, VTS star times PT. And you remember that, so, so these are, so this is the one three, this is the, hmm, what am I saying? So VUB is here, VUS is there. So each of these entries are sort of the scalar products of the second and the third column of the CKM matrix, right? VTB is here, VTS is here. So because of unitarity, I can write VTB, VTS as minus VCB, VCS minus VUB, VUS, right? This is just that the sum of the three is zero. So I can rewrite this whole thing as VCB, VCS times these combinations. And the point is that VCB, VCS is of order of the Kabibo angle squared because uh, VCS is very near one and VCB is of order lambda Kabibo squared. This term is of order lambda Kabibo to the four because VUB is lambda Kabibo three and VUS is, 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 is just the Kabibo angle itself. So, even without knowing anything about these hadronic matrix elements that I called P and T, one would expect this second term to be much smaller, at most a few percent of the first term. In addition, 
there is, so this is coming from a loop diagram. So historically, people expected these penguin amplitudes to be suppressed by 1 over 16 pi square compared to the three diagrams. Empirically, that suppression seems to be less than 1 over 16 pi square, but still, the absolute value of this combination of hadronic matrix elements is expected to be smaller than this. So, so why, that, why is that important? Because what I was, okay, so sorry. Let me backstep for a moment. So what I'm writing down here is the amplitude for, a, so, th so this is an initial B0 bar, goes to J psi K short. If I wrote down the amplitude for an initial B0, goes to J psi K short, then again, these T and P terms contain only strong phases coming from hadronic physics, and one would get the complex conjugate of the CKM elements. And, the, and, 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 and once this amplitude is dominated by terms with just one CKM structure, that is enough to ensure that A by over A, the ratio of the complex conjugate of this uh, sorry, of the CP conjugate of this amplitude divided by itself is going to be, so, so that direct CP violation cannot happen, plus uh, small corrections. And it also tells me that I can calculate what is, the, what is the phase of A by over A because it will essentially, okay, so the argument of A by over A is just going to be VCB VCS star divided by VCB star VCS because, so this was A bar and A, which is this amplitude, would just have the complex conjugate here and the second term is negligible. So, So what is lambda? Lambda is Q over P times A by over A. So Q over P, if you look there, it comes from box diagrams with a top quark. So its weak phase is given by VTB VTD star divided by VTB star VTD. Right, because it's just you're picking up four CKM elements at each of the vertices of the box diagram. A by over A, we just said it there that it's uh, going to be VCB, VCD star. Over VCB star. VCS, and if you don't want me to cheat, I should tell you that there is an additional subtlety that you see that B to, J, B to C, C bar S, so this is only giving you either, so in this case, you are getting a K bar zero, whereas in the CP conjugate process, you are getting a K0. So in order for, so it's really, the, you're looking at B2 J Psi K0 and B by goes to J Psi K by zero. In order for these final states to interfere, it is crucial that K0 and K0 by mix, and what you measure experimentally is not the K0, K0 by final state, but the K short final state, which is an almost equal CP even mixture of K0 and K0 bar, that's why interference can take place at all. Otherwise, if there was no K0, K0 bar mixing, you couldn't have interference here. And so there's an additional term. 
So what, so what this calculation tells you is really A bar for J psi K0 bar, J psi K0. But what we are interested in is A bar for psi K short over A psi K short. And so this will have an additional piece from KK bar mixing, which, uh, and since KK bar mixing is dominated by the box diagram with the chime quark, the additional piece, so I'm just writing down what was there before. And, and the KK bar mixing gives an additional phase, which is just the Chiam box diagram to a good approximation. So in particular, that guy goes away. So that's well, the next, uh, so okay, so, if, so, so, so that's because of KK bio mixing, instead of uh, VCS star over VCS, I have here VCD star over VCD. And if you look at the unitarity triangle on the top left corner of the box, then you see that this term, the phase of this term is just beta. The So we have VTB, VTD style, or well, VCD, VCD style. That's the term that I encircled there. And the other piece is just the complex conjugate of it. And if you are careful with signs, then you get that this is nothing else but minus e to the minus 2i beta. So the bottom line is that this time-dependent CPA symmetry measures a phase in the standard model Lagrangian, the phase of uh, those CKM elements that are defined there. And the hadronic uncertainties are at the percent level or below without having had to compute any hadronic physics at all. So I wanted to cover a little bit more, but uh, it's a... Uh, I will continue from here tomorrow. So, so what, I, what I wanted to say is that this time-dependent CPA symmetry measurements, so this was one example how it gives you information on weak phases without hadronic uncertainties. I will very quickly tomorrow show you a few other examples how similar measurements for other final states can, can give you other theoretically clean measurements of phases in the Lagrangian, either cross-checks on this measurement or other measurements which are sensitive to possible new physics affecting BB by mixing that could show up as a discrepancy between measurements which in the standard model relate to the same phase. I will show you tomorrow how that can be used to constrain new physics in BB biomixing. And, and, and that will probably take just the first 15 minutes of tomorrow. And then we'll dive into a little bit of uh, discussion about heavy quark effective theory. And uh, probably my goal for the end of tomorrow is to explain some ingredients of heavy quark effective theory and heavy quark symmetry, which will allow you to appreciate this plot, which is, uh, which is, uh, which, which I will explain tomorrow. Also, this relates to some semi-leptonic uh, uh, decay rate measurements in in B meson decays by Babar and LHCb and Bell, which right now seems to deviate uh, from the standard model in a very interesting way. So. Thank you, and uh, sorry for running out of time, and I'll take questions if you have any. Okay, thank you.